We are going to be making our way through Isaiah chapter 33, verses 7 through 12. Isaiah chapter 33, verses 7 through 12. Behold, their heroes cry in the streets. The envoys of peace weep bitterly. The highways lie waste. The traveler ceases. Covenants are broken. Cities are despised. There is no regard for man. The land mourns and languishes. Lebanon is confounded and withers away. Sharon is like a desert, and Bashan and Carmel shake off their leaves. Now I will arise, says the Lord. Now I will lift myself up. Now I will be exalted. You conceive chaff, you give birth to stubble. Your breath is a fire that will consume you. And the peoples will be as if burned to lime, like thorns cut down that are burned in the fire. Those are the verses that we're going to be diving into tonight, but before we can do that, we must do what we always do, back up, discuss what we talked about two weeks ago, so that way we keep everything in its proper context. Now, two weeks ago, we dove into Isaiah chapter 33, verses 1 through 6, and it's in those verses that, guess what, Isaiah is prophesying about, yes, Assyria. He refers to them as the destroyers. Now, now who is Assyria? Assyria is the pagan army that God is going to bring up to bring about his wrath upon his people. And why is he going to do this? Well, you think about everything that God has done for his own. He's rescued them. He's provided for them. He's protected them. He's brought them into the land that he promised them. And he told them, you have faith in me. You trust in me and nothing will hurt you. Nothing will hurt you. But what do his people do? They reject his teachings. They reject his commands. They reject his prophets. They reject everything that he has given to them. Not only do they do that, but they hear about these other armies coming around, and they, they panic. But they start going to others for protection. When God told them what? Rely upon me, and you will be okay. But their faith had dwindled. Yes, they were still practicing the very rituals that God had given them. But their motives weren't pure. They had abandoned God. Now, so often a question that is brought up, or an issue that is brought up, I should say, is why in the world does God bring up this pagan army to, to attack his own well, why would he do such a thing? Now, that's not a loving God. And, and this is something that we tend to forget about the holy triune God, and that is his holiness. The holiness of God is something that sadly we, the church, just do not grasp today. Now, I tried describing holiness in my own words, but the more I tried to do it, the dumber I realized I was. So I went to a brilliant man by the name of R.C. Sproul. This is what he says concerning the holiness of God. Pay, pay close attention to this. Sin is cosmic treason. Sin is treason against a perfectly pure sovereign. It is an act of supreme ingratitude toward the one to whom we owe everything, to the one who has given us life itself. Have you ever considered the deeper implications of the slightest sin? Of the most minute little detail of sin? What are we saying to our Creator when we disobey Him at the slightest point? We are saying no to the righteousness of God. We are saying, God, your law is not good. My judgment is better than yours. Your authority, God, does not apply to me. I am above and beyond your jurisdiction. I have the right to do what I want to do, not what you command me to do. When, when we sin, this is what we are going against. The holiness of God. The, the one who is perfect and pure. The very one who spoke us into existence. And here we are. The created 
telling the Creator, we know how to do it better than Him. And now I want you to ask the question to yourself, why would God bring His judgment upon His own people, the very ones who have rejected Him? Because God is holy. He is holy and pure. And how dare man tell Him that they know better? Now, even with the holiness of God, God was patient with the northern and the southern kingdom. They have been rejecting Him for a period of time. Even in the holiness of God, what does God do? He warns them with His word, with His prophets. And yet, the northern and the southern kingdom say, no thanks. We we can do this our own way. Now, now if we can pause just for a moment, what, what does this sound like? Does this not sound like a majority of churches today? Here God has given us everything that we need. He has given us more than what He has given the Old Testament saints. We have the entire truth laid out before us. And what do we do with that truth? Do we study it? Do we dive into it? Do we we pick it apart to help advance our knowledge of who God is? Sadly, most churches don't. And then we want to ask the question, why does God's wrath fall here the southern kingdom is about to find out that when you consistently reject God he is going to bring up an army to strike out against them why because the holiness of God cannot stand for the wicked and then that's what sin is. It is, is wickedness against the Holy One. So yes, God is bringing about His judgment upon the southern kingdom. But God is also going to bring about His judgment upon the Assyrians. And, and then here's the conundrum. Wait, 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 wait. For, for it was God who brought up the Assyrians. It's God who gave them the power, who gave them the ability... to to crush and dominate everyone that they go up against. Because the Assyrians, they're developing an empire. And they're becoming extremely powerful. But the Assyrians don't worship God. They're, They're pagans. They have their own false idols. And yes, this is who God is bringing up to bring about His judgment. And yes, these are the very people that God is going to destroy. He called them the destroyers last week through the Isaiah the prophet. But he's also setting up that their wickedness, his justice is going to fall upon as well. So here, God is telling the southern kingdom that the Assyrians will be crushed. But there's good news in what we were hearing last week also, or two weeks ago I should say, Even though the majority of the northern and the southern kingdom have rebelled against God, there's always going to be this remnant. And two weeks ago, we heard about this remnant through the prophet. He's saying that the southern kingdom isn't going to be lost. It is going to continue on because of a faithful minority. That's what was promised. Even though the majority has rebelled, there is going to be a minority that God is going to work through. And we know why. Because it's going to be through that minority that the Son, the promised Redeemer, is going to come from. It's also going to be this minority that is going to cry out to God. It is also going to be this minority that is still believing in God. They are still holding to His word even though the majority have rejected Him. God will be their protector. He will be their provider. And in doing so, God will be the one that brings down the wicked Assyrians. And through this minority, the southern kingdom will grow about once again. Okay. Here we go, Isaiah chapter 33. Let's look at verse 7. Behold, 
Their heroes cry in the streets. The envoys of peace weep bitterly. Okay, again, we're, we're seeing Isaiah the prophet, and he, he's speaking about the Assyrians planning on the invasion of the southern kingdom. And it seems a bit strange, doesn't it? Because we just went from God through the prophet Isaiah talking about destroying the Assyrians. Now we're coming back to the Assyrians planning on invading the southern kingdom to bring about God's wrath. Now what we're looking at through the, the, the prophet Isaiah, it's done over a, a long period of time. When we're talking about the destruction of the Assyrians, it, it's not just overnight. It, it's going to be about a hundred years. That's how long God is going to give this powerful empire, but that's how long he is going to take to crush them. And, and so often, we, we may even question this. And it's like, well, why does... Why does God's justice take so long at times? Because he's perfect and we're not. It's, it's his plan and not ours. So he is going to be glorified whether he brings about his wrath upon the wickedness within a day or two or if it's a hundred years. Now there's something that we have to do here because in chapter 36 we're, we're going to start getting some names. But we have to understand this history first of what is taking place so that we can understand these verses that we're about to work our way through. We learn in chapter 36 that there is going to be a King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah is of the southern kingdom. And what King Hezekiah is going to try to do is everything within his power to reason with King Sennacherib. And King Sennacherib is the one over the Assyrians. But sadly, it doesn't matter what takes place and what King Hezekiah tries to do. King Sennacherib isn't a loyal or an honest man. So with all these promises that King Sennacherib makes to the southern kingdom, he goes back on every single one of them. So what is going to take place is we, we have Sennacherib, the one over the Assyrian army. And he's going to be promised an amount from the southern kingdom. And he agrees to this amount. And this amount is to provide peace between them. But like we just said, Sennacherib is not an honest nor a loyal man. All he cares about is power and destruction and growing his empire. So it is from this, the news comes back from the envoy, that being the diplomats that were sent to speak on behalf of the southern kingdom. And when these diplomats lay out this plan, this idea, King Sennacherib tells the envoy, yes, we received your money. Yes, we said that this was going to, we're going to continue this peaceful, uh, that's the word I'm looking for, I just went blank. This peace between us, we'll go with that. But King Sennacherib says that's not going to happen. I'm coming for you. This is what's going to take place. Assyria is going to dominate the southern kingdom. So, so here this envoy, they get this, this news, the diplomats of the southern kingdom, they bring it back. And they're crushed by this. They're crushed by this. And then it speaks of the heroes in the street, that being the soldiers of Judah, the, the southern kingdom. They hear this news, and they know that they cannot stand against this massive empire. But we're also seeing something else within the southern kingdom. We're seeing this idea that they could still rely upon man to bail themselves out from this wicked army that's coming after them. Instead, what was the promise? The promise was that God was going to protect them. So even when they hear the news, even when they hear the news the Assyrians are still coming after them, what does the majority do? Do they look to God? No. They're trying to make plans. But we see something in King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah is a faithful man. King Hezekiah being the one over the southern kingdom. A faithful man to God. One of the things that he's wanting to do is to purify the southern kingdom. Because for a period of time, the king before Hezekiah 
was paying the Assyrians so much so that they would not attack them. Not only was he paying him, but he was also bringing in the false idols so that they would worship them. They were bringing them into the temple to worship them, God's temple. But when Hezekiah finally took over, he goes, we cannot continue to do this. We, we have to purify this land. So Hezekiah thought he was doing everything that he possibly could. But it didn't work. So the Assyrians are coming after the southern kingdom. Now look at verse 8. It says, the highways lie waste. The traveler ceases. So the southern kingdom, upon hearing this disastrous news, they, they would be concerned. Traveling would stop for the most part because they weren't sure when this attack was coming. It goes on to say that covenants are broken. Now, of course, this is speaking of King Sennacherib of Assyria, who agreed to keep the peace between them and the southern kingdom. And even with the money that's being paid to him, he breaks that covenant. For Assyria had no intention of keeping it. It goes on to say that cities are despised. There is no regard for man. But the Assyrian king wasn't bothered if his reputation would be tainted for breaking a covenant, a promise that he had with the king of Judah. Once again, all he cared about was his power, his wealth. All he wanted to do was conquer another land. He didn't care what the people thought of him. Now let's pause right there for a moment, if we will. Of course we're going to, because I said we're going to pause, and that's what we're going to, that's what we're going to do. But you can tell a lot about a leader. You can tell a lot about a king, a, a president, and how they view humanity. For a godly man would do everything in their power to keep life flowing. Not to end it, but to keep it going. Why? Because he respects the Creator. Well, why would he want to destroy the very thing that God created? So when we're talking about the king of Assyria, we're seeing a godless man. Yes, he worshiped false gods, but he's a godless man. His word means absolutely nothing. To where is a godly man, a godly woman, holds to their word? It, it means something because that promise you make is a promise that you're also making to God. Because if you break that promise, you are sinning against God. Once again, we see this godless king breaking promises because he just doesn't care. It's all about himself. Now look at verse 9. It says, The land mourns and languishes. Lebanon is confounded and withers away. Sharon is like a desert. Mashan and Carmel shake off their leaves. Now I'm going to be honest with you here. That, that's kind of a good thing if I say I'm going to be honest with you. I should be. Um, I, I'm not certain if this portion, if these verses are to be taken literally or figuratively. Or it very well could be both. The land that Isaiah has given us, these lands that have been laid out before us, th these are far off from one another. That, that being in the region that God has given to his people. So Isaiah could be saying that all of these regions that he named were concerned about the news of the Assyrians coming for them. Which is sad because this is the Holy Land. This is the very land that God told his people, you trust in me and you will be protected. And yet, what are they doing? They're panicking. Why? Because they do not trust in God. There's only a small minority. The majority of them no longer look to him. So they're panicking. So it could be referring to the Holy Land as having no hope. No hope. 
So God, through Isaiah, is taking the most beautiful regions of the Holy Land, and he's showing them withering away. That the beauty is gone. Because right? I mean, that's what truly happens when man does not have hope in God. That there is no beauty left. That was an amen. Now, if this is to be taken literal, literally I should say, Isaiah could be describing the results that the Assyrian army brings upon these regions that they do invade. This could be the destruction that is being prophesied in this beautiful land. It very well could be figurative, it very well could be literal, it could be absolutely both. But what we're seeing here is God has told his people time and time again that he is going to be their protector. The people have rejected him. But for those, the minority, the remnant, that has kept their faith in God, I want you to look at how God keeps his covenant with them. Now, this, this minority... That they're hearing about this Assyrian army that, that is just bringing about destruction upon the lands all around them. And they're hearing about them coming up against not only the southern kingdom, but also the northern kingdom. They're, they're watching everyone else panic. And yet here this minority is. Their, their faith in God. Their, their faith that he is going to protect them. Do you know what the, the majority of the land would be looking at the minority? And they'd be like, look at these weirdos. I mean, here we are. We're, we're panicking. We're trying to figure this out. We're actually making a deal with Egypt so that they're going to protect us when the Assyrian army makes their way in. And yet you had this minority that's saying, no, 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 we're in good hands. For our faith is in God and Him alone and He promised protection. Sadly, that's the way it still is today, especially in this land that was once built upon Christian principles. For, for those of us whose faith truly is in God, that, that remnant who, whose faith is in Christ and Him alone, the, the majority looks at us as if we're the oddballs. But that's what we were promised. When you hold to the word of God, you're going to be seen as an outcast by way of the world. And it's shocking in a way, isn't it? I mean, when you're having to screen Disney movies to make sure that your children can watch them. And we're called the ones who are narrow minded because we don't want a lesbian scene in a cartoon. It's, it's weird, isn't it? I mean, you, you kind of sit back and you're, you're wondering why there's, there's drag queens performing in libraries. And you're wondering why the parents are taking their kids to drag queen shows and you say something about it. And it's like, well, what's wrong with you? And it's like, nothing's wrong with me. What's, what's wrong with you? Why are you exposing your children to this? So here you have this minority group within the southern kingdom who, whose faith is in God and they, they know that he's going to protect them and it seems as if all around them it's getting darker and darker as the fear of Assyria is growing larger and larger. But look at what takes place in verse 10. It says, Now I will arise says the lord now i will lift myself up now i will be exalted now i want you to see something here then notice in all these all these sections right here what's god going to do i will arise i will lift myself up i will be exalted you had this Assyrian army that has just terrified the world because they are so powerful. There's no army, there's no nation, there's no empire that can stand against them. I mean, you even have God's own people who are terrified of them. The majority of them, that is. But it's here. God is going to show the world 
and his own, that he is the sovereign one. That there is no human that is more powerful than God. There is no army that is more powerful than God. There is no king more powerful than God. And there is no false God that is more powerful than God. For it is God who is the conqueror. And he's going to show it to them when he brings down the Assyrian Empire. Now look at verse 11. It says, you can see chaff and you give birth to stubble. Your breath is a fire that will consume you. The you here is referring to the destroyer, that being Assyria. Justice is coming for them. For every single sin that they have committed, justice is coming for them. And this justice is going to be like a slow boil. It starts around 701 B.C. That's when the angel of the Lord is going to kill 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. And he's going to do this to rescue the land of Judah. The angel of the Lord wipes out 185,000 soldiers. You know who the king was during that time? That would be King Sennacherib. Once this takes place, because his, his plan was he was going to attack Jerusalem. He had them all set up and ready to go. And in the dark of night, 185,000 soldiers are wiped out. King Sennacherib gets up that next morning. His army is just decimated. So what does he do? He heads back to Nineveh. And it's there in Nineveh that one of his own sons end up killing him. Again, you see the justice of God prevailing. And it would finally be around 608 B.C. I'm jumping way ahead here when Assyria would be destroyed once and for all by God. Now look at verse 12. It says, And the peoples will be as if burned to lime, like thorns cut down that are burned in the fire. Now peoples all throughout the book of Isaiah has referred to the nations surrounding the land of Canaan. These are the people that God's own look to for protection instead of God himself. And Isaiah is saying to the people of Judah, the people of the southern kingdom, why would you place your trust in these men? Why? Because they are nothing more than kindling in the presence of the almighty, holy God. The very ones, the very ones that the southern kingdom feared, that they were terrified of, and they're looking to these other nations to protect them. God is telling them, well, what are you doing? I, I was your protector the entire time. You're looking to men when you should have been looking to me. But because God made that covenant with that remnant, he protected did they deserve that protection? Absolutely not. For it was God who gave them the faith to believe in him to begin with. But when God, once God makes that covenant, he holds to it. The Old Testament all the way into the New. And, and this is what I mean by going into the New. That promise was made to every single person whose faith is placed in Christ. That you have been redeemed. That man, nor army, nor nation could take that from you. Oh, believer, why? Because God gave you that faith. He made that promise that once it's been given, once that faith has been placed in Christ, you have been redeemed and you will stand righteous before God. Once God makes that covenant, he keeps it. He holds on to it, even though you will fail him. He keeps that covenant on your behalf. He did it in the Old Testament, and he continues all throughout the New. All right, questions? Questions?